Welcome to part 3. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is the biggest fighting game in history. But, once again, you already know that. That's why you're here. So, today I thought we could look back on all the Origin games, again, again. So what is an Origin game? Well, if your character is playable in that game, it counts. So, going with the old reliable example of Ganondorf, he's never playable in any of the Zelda games, so he wouldn't be ranked. Another thing I have to mention is party games like Mario Kart and Mario Party aren't being ranked, your character must be playable in like a mainline game kind of thing, but I will include side games that are really just for Mario Kart and Mario Party. Arcade games also won't be ranked, your game must be on a home console or on a portable. And finally, please keep in mind I'm scaling these games based on what they're trying to be and not what they are, meaning that you might disagree when I give a certain game the same rating as another, but just remember I'm rating an RPG as an RPG and a platformer as a platformer. Anyways, with all that out of the way, let's finally begin with our first character. I'm gonna be completely honest, I don't know if I'm right when I say that Kirby's Return to Dreamland is King Dedede's first playable game, but I'm gonna say it is because it allows me to talk about a game from my childhood. Kirby's Return to Dreamland wasn't my first game, but I have the most memories of playing this one and Donkey Kong Country Returns. I remember so many levels from this game. I'll never forget how big of a twist it was when I realized that there were two whole worlds left after the first five, and Magalore being the villain left me in shambles. Also, this is one of the coolest final bosses in a platformer. I love Kirby, and it's been great replaying his games for this series. I've mentioned in other videos, but Kirby has the perfect balance between not frustrating but not mind-numbingly easy. I did die a few times in this game, but it didn't frustrate me like a lot of the other games I've played. The copy abilities in this game are also all fantastic. And we have these new super strong power-ups, which is where Kirby gets his final smash from. Another great new addition is these rooms that are like race to the finish. If I'm remembering correctly, these bosses at the end of those rooms are completely optional, and you only fight them if you want the gears they have. Speaking of gears, there are three per level and they work as this game's collectibles. The level design is so good that 4 player multiplayer works within them. You can either play as 4 Kirby's or you can play as King Dedede, Meta Knight, and a Waddle Dee. Now you may ask, but how do you get copy abilities if you weren't Kirby? And that was a stupid question and you should be ashamed. But the way it works is that Dedede constantly has the hammer power up, Meta Knight has the sword, and Waddle Dee has the spear. So they're like Kirby, except they can't lose their copy abilities. Also, inside Magalore's ship, you can find these copy ability rooms where you race to the finish and try to collect as many coins as you can. There's also this robot fighting one and the best mini game ever, Ninja Dojo. I love Ninja Dojo. Sometimes I boot up this game just to play that. The controls are great, the level design is great, the bosses are great, everything overall is just so good. I would say this is a very consistently good game. Overall, Kirby's Return to Dreamland is just consistently great. 8.5 out of 10. Pikmin 1 is a game that is good, but there isn't really much I can say. In Pikmin 1, you play as this guy named Olimar, who is sent to a planet to find treasure so that his company can make more money. However, on the way you get hit by an asteroid and your ship ends up crash landing, and it soon realizes that the ship can't be easily repaired. But on the planet, you find these little helpful creatures that you name Pikmin. The Pikmin will follow you and do tasks like take stuff back to your ship or attack enemies, and any Pikmin who aren't with you at the end of the day are eaten by nocturnal creatures. Your goal is to find the parts of your ship within 30 days, as after that you die from your life support ending. While you have to find the parts of your ship, you're also tasked with finding materials that will make you money. The kinds of monsters you find are super well designed. The kind of art style Pikmin has reminded me of the amazing world of Gumball. The mix between the real world objects and the cartoony Pikmin and Olimar is great. The controls also work surprisingly well, although the Wii controls will always be superior. The sounds and music are both fantastic as well. The ambience is all just great in this game, and all the different Pikmin are great because they all have their let alone tasks to do. My one problem is that this game is a bit too short because of the 30 day limit, and I feel like 2 and 3 go a little further with the game's ideas. Overall, Pikmin 1 is a great start to one of my favorite Nintendo series. 8 out of 10. I'm counting Alf for two reasons. One, he has a different name than Olimar, and I think that's good enough. And two, I want to talk about Pikmin 3. I played Pikmin 3 before 1 and 2, meaning that I have way more nostalgia for this game than the others. But after I've played all of them, I would still say that 3 is objectively the best. The puzzles, boss fights, new Pikmin, and new mechanics are all too good and just feel so fresh. 
The game feels wildly different from the first two. While the first two seemed kinda like they were closely connected, 3 feels like a bit of a soft reboot with an all new cast of characters. Olimar and Louis are characters, but you never really play as them and they're only referenced to prior to the fourth area. So the game kinda feels completely different. You even meet some new Pikmin friends on your adventure, specifically the Rock Pikmin and the Flying Pikmin. Both are pretty self-explanatory, however, the game replaced the old Purple Pikmin and Purple I get, the Rock Pikmin kinda take their place, but White Pikmin were really interesting and I kinda wish they were still there. The game starts off pretty creatively with a ship malfunctioning and you, playing as Elf, get stranded and have to find your teammates. You find your first teammate very quickly and befriend the Pikmin as you trace your captain's trail, and you find he's inside this large moth thing. After slaying the moth, he pops out and the game really begins. The three-person setup is so interesting because, for example, you can have one go do the main mission, one go get fruit, and the other go get new Pikmin or these special berries. Speaking of that, these berries will fill up this glass, and if you spray a glass on your Pikmin, they become much more powerful and fast. And speaking of fruit, instead of getting it for money like in the first game, you have to get them to survive. Each fruit has a different amount of juice inside of it, and at the end of the day, all your fruits will be juiced for consumption. The entire time you're chasing someone who stole your dry key, which is the only way to get home, and that turns out to be Olimar. You get it back, and the game ends. Overall, I really like Pikmin 3. It feels so freeing to do whatever you would want to on a specific day. I used to love mapping out my days and what I would do with them. 9 out of 10. We skip Gen 3 because there is no Gen 3 Rep and Smash, and we move on right to Gen 4 with Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Pokemon Diamond was the first mainline Pokemon game on the DS. Before this, it was just a bunch of spin-offs, and honestly, it's kind of amazing how much they nailed it the first time. This is one of the ways to show off how the DS's dual screens weren't just a gimmick and could actually provide integral aspects to a game. The whole menu on the bottom screen and the characters on the top works super well. You can tell it works because they use it on every Pokemon game on the DS or 3DS. The new Pokemon here are also all great. This may be one of the best generations in that regard. The graphics look pretty good for being the first game on the DS, and the music is just as sharp as ever. The story, however... Look, I know Pokemon game strength isn't their stories, but this game is just a little bit too much sometimes. It's so similar to the previous games, they all have the exact same story. I will become the greatest trainer! Uh oh, domestic terrorism! The legendary Pokemon will be mine because I defeated the big bad guy! I am the best Pokemon trainer to ever live! It's a tried and true formula that has been basically the exact same since the first game. But while Pokemon Diamond doesn't deviate too much from this formula, it's still really good. The game in general is fine, normal Pokemon gameplay of catching monsters and making them fight to the death. The gym leaders are also all really cool, and after playing two of the Game Boy games, I can appreciate how much this game evolved the series, but it still does feel kinda stuck in the past in terms of gameplay. Overall, Pokemon Diamond is a great step forward for the first DS game, 8 out of 10. The final Zelda game I'll be taking a look at, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is possibly the most out of the box Zelda. After Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask being such dark games, I think it's fair to say many expected a much nicer looking dark Zelda game. And well... The Legend is back. Many people actually didn't like The Wind Waker upon reveal, stating that it looked too family friendly after the dark and gritty Majora's Mask was critically praised to no end. But after playing Wind Waker, I absolutely love this game. I played HD when it came out, but after playing the original, it's kinda crazy that this game from 2003 is still so fantastic. It takes place 100 years after Ocarina of Time, and you play as this kid who's given this grand journey after his sister is kidnapped by this bird thing. You use this boat to sail to different islands to either shop, fight enemies, find new villages, or find new dungeons. The game is seemingly non-linear, and to a certain extent, it is. You can choose which island to go to initially, except for some, and each has something for you to do on. However, the game does somewhat flow you through where it wants you to go. This is no Breath of the Wild. The animations are all fantastic, and I really love the style of the game. It's so unique, and despite looking kinda cartoony, it doesn't take away from the experience. If anything, it adds to it. The music is great as always. This is a Zelda game after all. My one issue with this game is, ironically, the Wind Waker itself. I don't like that you have to use it so frequently and this unskippable animation plays every single time. I wish there was a way to skip it or it just stopped playing after a while, but besides that, this game is great. Overall, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is fantastic, but not exactly perfect. 
8.5 out of 10. Villager's first game is Animal Crossing for the GameCube. My history with Animal Crossing is that I only own New Horizons. I promise I'm qualified enough to talk about this. I played City Folk and New Leaf a bit, but I mostly spend time on New Horizons. I love New Horizons, but one of my biggest problems is just how uninteresting some of the villagers can be. They always seem to cycle between the same three things, but in the original, these villagers are super interesting. I have no idea why they're so much more interesting in the first game than in the newest one. I I love talking to them, they all have such interesting and funny things to say. Each of them has so much personality and they're all so fun to talk to. The game starts out pretty strong with you having to work for Tom Nook to pay off your debts. You do things like deliver packages, plant flowers, and talk to villagers. But going from New Horizons to this one, there is so much less to do. I can play New Horizons for hours at a time, but I can't even manage more than one hour of this game. There's just so little to do. Like, sure, I could just fish and find fossils for hours, but why? In New Horizons, it feels like there's always something for me to do. Because of the way the game is set up, you can constantly edit your island to make it look nicer. There is nothing that makes me more insecure than looking at New Horizons Islands online and comparing it to my waste hole. I have like almost 100 hours on New Horizons, but I just don't have anything to do in the original. I mean, it's still Animal Crossing. It's still a fun collectathon with the cute, quirky personality it's always had, but there just is so little for me to do. Overall, the original Animal Crossing is great, just kind of boring sometimes, 7.5 out of 10. Uh... Mega Man is one of those games I can point to when I say that I don't like a lot of NES games. Mega Man is such a cool and revolutionary game. It was one of the first non-linear games ever made, letting you select which levels you go to and when you go to them. The way Mega Man is set up is you play as this dude named Mega Man, and you can jump and shoot a pew pew out of your arm. You choose between six of these bosses and you go through this romp until you reach the end and fight the boss you chose. Once you defeat the boss, you unlock its power, and you can use this instead of your standard pew pew. However, you have to charge up these abilities, and you don't have to charge up your pew pew, so it's always better to just use that. Each boss is weak to another boss's ability, so you can also use that to quickly defeat them. The levels are all a good length, and they're all pretty visually different for an NES game. The sprite work is also fantastic. The game in general looks very good. So, this all sounds super cool. What was I talking about at the beginning? Well... Okay. Mega Man is a cool and super great game, but it's way too hard. This game is so frustrating and just way too difficult for its own good. If you can defeat the Yellow Devil without the use of the pause trick, you may be the most elite gamer I have ever seen. If you have actually beaten this game on the original NES without any form of exploits, there is no way you actually exist. The platforming is frustrating, the enemies are near impossible to avoid, the game in general needs to be much easier for me to enjoy it personally. Overall, the original Mega Man was revolutionary, but is nowadays way, way too hard. 7 out of 10. Greninja's origin region is Pokemon X and Y, and so far two of these characters have been from games I have a lot of nostalgia for, and Pokemon X will just add to that. This was my first Pokemon game, and looking at its release date is terrifying. I promise I'm not that young, I just never got a Pokemon game before this, but I remember loving the anime and loving the trading card game, and my mom bought this for me when I got my new 3DS. Not like the new 3DS, but buying a 3DS when it was new. I've played through this game a ton of times, and I've always loved it. Kalos is such a great and underrated region. The France inspiration is fantastic. The starters here are… fine. Fennekin is cool, but I just don't like what he evolves into. Chespin is also just okay, and I don't really like what he evolves into. Froki is the obvious pick here in my opinion. Greninja is the best final evolution, but I think the other two deserve some love sometimes. Greninja gets a little bit too much attention. The new Pokemon in general are all very good, and there was a new type added this region, being Fairy-type. I like Fairy-type Pokemon, and I think it's generally a good type to have to be the opposite to Dark. The story is pretty okay, it's just kinda like every other one where there's this evil organization trying to manipulate Pokemon. But I will stand by the fact that the best inclusion in this game is Mega Evolutions. While I think things like Dynamaxing are going a little bit too far into the gimmicky side, Mega Evolutions were a great idea. The way it works is only some Pokemon can Mega Evolve, and to do that you need a specific stone for their evolution, and if you have them hold that, they become a lot stronger in the middle of battle. 
Also, all of these look super cool. I love the Mega Charizard X I had on my team when I originally played this. Overall, I really like Pokemon X, but the story's a little generic. 8 out of 10. What can I really say? It's Pac-Man. Everyone knows Pac-Man. I can't give some super detailed review of this game because there just isn't anything to say. For the aliens watching this, Pac-Man is a game where you play as this yellow guy whose goal is to eat all these pellets. These ghosts will try to stop you and running into them kills you. You can find these power pellets that allow you to eat the ghosts and for a short amount of time you're basically invincible. The game is the definition of easy to play, hard to master. You could probably spend days playing this game and wouldn't even be close to beating it. This is an extremely hard game, but that's why it's fun. It was originally an arcade game after all, and it works well as one. Overall, Pac-Man is a classic and simple game, 7.5 out of 10. Xenoblade Chronicles is fantastic. It was basically my first introduction to the whole genre of RPGs. Shulk is such a cool protagonist, and I just love all the different ideas this game comes up with. The idea of the Bionis and the Mechonis, Shulk's ability to see the future, the battle system, Nopons in general. The game begins with you playing as this guy named Dunban in this intense fight against these robots called the Mechon. You then get double-crossed by your friend and get really injured. And now is where the game really begins. Shulk is in love with Dunban's daughter Fiora, and after she's taken by the Mechonis, Shulk, Dunban, and his friend Ryan all decide to go save her. Through this process, Shulk realizes he's the chosen one, of course, this is an RPG, and he can wield the Xenoblade, I mean the Monado. You then go on this grand adventure, finding new friends and side quests along the way, and the whole time you adventure on one of the best ideas for a map in all of gaming. In the universe of this game, there was a clash between two giants called the Bionis and the Mechonis. They both stabbed each other and died, and thousands of years later, people now live on top of them. On Bionis live the humans, and on Mechonis live the robots. These two sides are constantly battling for territory and control. Throughout your adventure, you'll venture to many different areas, battle many new enemies, and meet many new friends. It's a great RPG in general with a great story. The characters really shine here too. I love Shulk, Ryan, Fiora, and Ricky, who a lot of people hate for some reason? Look at him! How could you hate him? The graphics are pretty good for running on the Wii, and the game actually looks pretty good sometimes. Finally, the music is absolutely beautiful. Overall, Xenoblade Chronicles is a fantastic RPG. 9 out of 10. Unless I'm mistaken, Bowser Jr.'s first playable game is the recently released Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. This game is a remake of Super Mario 3D World, so I think we should talk a little bit about that game. 3D World was not the game it needed to be. When Nintendo announced that they were going to be making a new 3D Mario game, I think it's fair to say that we expected something along the lines of a new open world 3D Mario game, or Galaxy 3 even. But what we ended up with was a very linear 2D Mario game in 3D. Now that we have Odyssey, I can appreciate 3D World a lot more, but when I first bought it, I was actually pretty lukewarm on it. I thought that the game was solid enough, but I just kind of wish that there was a more open world game on the Wii U, and I think that's the reason a lot of people didn't like this game. The game itself is good, but it just wasn't what people wanted. Keep in mind, this was during the new Super Mario Bros era. People were bored of this safe 2D Mario style, and when they expected a new and revolutionary 3D game, but just got this, it wasn't enough. However, this game is now on the Switch, which has a plethora of 3D Mario games, including that brand new open world one. 3D World works a lot better on the Switch, and Bowser's Fury is probably one of the best Wii U ports of all time. They went through and made so many small quality of life changes, like how the stamps are now in color, how the menus are slightly different, how the game now saves in the background. They also went through and made everyone's running speed faster, and it's quite noticeable and makes the game feel really fresh, even on a second playthrough. Finally, they made the Captain Toad levels multiplayer, which is a fantastic change. I recommend this game to anyone, even if you already played 3D World. This isn't just a re-release, it's a new fantastic experience. Overall, Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fu- Oh yeah, Bowser's Fury. The whole reason I did this review. I forgot. Bowser's Fury is also great. It's a short romp through this completely connected world where you find these cat shines to keep Fury Bowser at bay, but eventually you can turn into, uh this and fight Fury Bowser. The completely connected world and normal camera make this feel more like a traditional 3D Mario experience. The whole thing is rock solid and riding Plessy around is super fun. This whole experience is fantastically designed. 
Overall, Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury is a fantastic blend of a more linear multiplayer 3D Mario and a more traditional single player 3D Mario. 9 out of 10. <laughs> Duck Hunt is a very weird game. It's a game you don't play with the NES controller, rather you play with the NES zapper. You aim at these ducks and try to murder as many as you can, and if you don't hit it, you get the first true villain in gaming. The game is super simple, as you literally just shoot at these ducks. You can use clay pigeons, but nothing beats gutting a duck. There really isn't much I can say about Duck Hunt, it's a very simple arcade-like NES game. Overall, there just isn't much to say about it, but it is a pretty solid game in general. 7.5 out of 10. What's odd about Ryu is that I'm going to be looking at Street Fighter 2. As to my knowledge, Street Fighter 1 has never been on a console before 2. Street Fighter 2 is kind of like Street Fighter's Melee, if that makes sense. It's an old game that has fantastic mechanics and is still played to this day. I can see why it's still played, it's a super fun game, and while the inputs can be a little different than what I'm used to, I played a lot of Ken and a ton of Terry when he came out. So I'm pretty used to the Hadouken, Tatsumaki Senpyu, Kaku, and Shoryuken inputs. I tried some of the other characters, but I really gravitated towards Ryu and Ken. Is that because they're meant to be starter characters and I already know the inputs? Maybe. But Street Fighter 2 has a great and expansive roster. Whether you want a straight up brawler like Zangief or a Mozona character like Dalsum, this game has it all. I've never played a real fighting game before, but even I got the hang of this one pretty quickly. There is a bit of a learning curve, but after that, it's super fun. Overall, Street Fighter 2 is a fantastic and fun game. 8.5 out of 10. So, that's it for part 3. Wow, I, I can't believe it, I'm actually almost done this series. This has been a very long series to do. I think with this episode, the whole runtime of this series might have reached an hour, which is insane. I'm sure when I'm done this, I'll release all the parts in a single video, just in case you wanted to watch an hour and a half of me talking about games for some reason. But until part 4 comes out, you'll just have to watch 1, 2, and 3 separately. Also, I have literally never done this on my channel, and so this isn't really something I would normally say, but if you could support this video, that would be great in any way you can, commenting, liking, whatever. I never say this because I think it's really dumb, like you know if you like a video to like the video. But I'm saying this because these videos don't get that much support, and these are really long and hard videos to make, so if I could get some support, that'd be really nice, thank you. And thank you for just watching this far in. Anyways, uh, that's all for me. Part 4 should be out pretty soon, I have a lot of the script written, and a lot of the characters are games I've already played, so. But enough about that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.